Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you are having fantastic Tuesdays wherever you may be across the country or around the world. Um, we got a lot to dive into. Joe Biden had a speech last night. Uh, biggest takeaway for me. Um, Alvin Bragg, Venue versus FUBU. Sam Ponder fired, uh, which happened last week, but I wasn't around. Now they've hired her replacement on uh, the NFL pregame show. RFK Jr. may be dropping out according to the odds. Oklahoma State has put QR codes on the helmets of their football players. Teleprompter should be banned. That's my big takeaway from the conventions. Uh, Andy Bashir says that he hopes uh, that, uh, that J.D. Vance's family will have to go through someone getting raped and pregnant. Uh, Alexander Cooper, three years, $100 million plus on Sirius XM. And what are the most annoying male hobbies, according to women? Uh, but we began with prize picks. Uh, we got college football returning from Ireland on Saturday. I cannot wait. What is it? Georgia Tech against FSU, I think, is the game that is taking place this Saturday. I will have a gambling pick for you up tomorrow on OutKick. I'll probably talk about it on this program as well. But in the meantime, Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app with Prize Picks, you against the number. You can win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. That means you can turn $10 into $1,000. Caleb Williams, if he passes for one passing yard, you get a win every week. Week in September. That means every week in September, you should be betting on Caleb Williams. If he has one yard passing, you get an automatic win. Uh, four weekends of free W's. I will be doing it as well. Uh, don't miss the deal on prize picks. Gone when September ends. Prize picks, best way to win out there. Real money this football season. Which players are going off? Which ones aren't? Make your picks in less than a minute. Turn your sports opinions into real money. Uh, I love prize picks. We'll be playing it every single week, all season long with football. Download the prize picks app today. Use code OUTKICK. First deposit match up to 100 bucks. That's code OUTKICK. Outkick prize picks first deposit match up to 100 bucks prize picks run your game uh okay uh last night what was my takeaway with joe biden last night um to me biden it was maybe the most inauthentic in what is a profoundly inauthentic space that is all of politics whether you're a democrat republican independent whatever you are for everyone there to have forced out Joe Biden, to have metaphorically stabbed him in the back, tossed him off their boat, for them not to allow him to show up to speak until roughly 11.30 p.m. Eastern, after almost everybody on the East Coast has gone to bed, and for them to decide that they are going to somehow chant, we love Joe, all these different things. I thought Nancy Pelosi standing there with the we love Joe sign was so profoundly pathetic um, and thoroughly inauthentic. Biden's speech itself was a screaming, doddering, shot up with adrenaline style weird ride, not particularly unifying at all, uh, not very well written, filled with lies. He continues, I'm going to come back to the Charlottesville lie in a moment because I think it's the most pernicious and long-lasting of all the lies. Um, also, the, uh, the suckers uh, thing about uh, uh, suckers and losers or whatever it was associated with uh, soldiers, um, and the lie about the bloodbath, the lie about dictatorships. Um, but I want to focus in particular on the very fine people hoax that Joe Biden has propagated now for basically seven years and that the left-wing media has allowed to flourish for that long, too. Joe Biden said that he ran for president because of the Charlottesville uh, rally surrounding a Robert E. Lee statue because he said Donald Trump referred to Nazis and white supremacists as very fine people, and he decided then and there that he had to run for president. Trump never said that. It's a lie. He specifically condemned neo-Nazis, uh, people who are white supremacists. You can go watch it yourself. They selectively edited and cut his commentary to leave that out 
And they've been trying to say that he said there were very fine people on both sides. He did not. He said specifically condemning white supremacist neo-Nazis. He said the truth, which is there are very fine people who don't believe that we should be tearing down monuments. And there are very fine people who believe that we should. Okay? That was the very fine people comment. Biden lied about it. He said he ran because Trump called neo-Nazis and white supremacists very fine people. Um, And he's been saying it for seven years. It's a true nasty lie. And no one will actually correct it in left-wing media because they want it to be true because it's politically helpful to them. But if Joe Biden claims that he ran because of what happened in Charlottesville, then not even examining anything else, Biden's tenure as president is a complete failure. Because what's happened in the wake of Charlottesville during his presidency is we've got Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where the University of Virginia is located. We've got protests like that from the East Coast to the West Coast, from Columbia to UCLA. There are anti-Semites out there on the march who happen to be Democrats arguing that the Jewish people are to blame for October 7th and that they are the real uh, terrorists not Hamas, which attacked them on October 7th. These kids are morons that are making that argument. They should be called out by everyone in the Democrat Party. Instead, Biden last night said they have a point. That is, the thousands of anti-Jewish protesters who are walking around with Hamas flags, who are arguing that Palestine must be free and that the Jews are to blame for everything that's going wrong in the Middle East. Biden said they had a point. So after spending all this time as president and all the time during his campaign focused on that as the primary goal with which he says his campaign was motivated, Biden now is actually endorsing the very fine people hoax, which isn't true at all, by saying that the people who are marching around with Hamas flags outside of the Democrat National Convention have a point. His campaign began with a lie about what Trump said. It's now ending with Biden actually saying what he claims Trump said. It's a big deal. It should get a great deal of attention. Most people in the media are dishonest. They're not going to focus on it. But Biden is now endorsing what he claims was the motivation for why he had to run for president. And by the way, if we really had misinformation or disinformation, whatever you want to call them, fact checkers in the media, Biden's claim on uh, the uh, on the very fine people hoax is seven years running. And he never stops saying it, even though it's a lie. And even though he consistently gets called on it, he never actually changes his speech because it's a useful lie to him. Okay, uh, several other things that are out there. Steve Kerr spoke at the DNC. He said, and there's an article up about it at uh, OutKick, he said that it took great courage for him to speak. Liar. It did not take any courage at all for Steve Kerr to show up at the Democrat National Convention and endorse Kamala. He had already done it, first of all, at the Olympics. But to show up in Chicago and endorse Kamala and claim that it takes great courage is not true at all. What would take great courage is something that Steve Kerr is not willing to do. That's actually call out China and support basic human rights around the world, which Steve Kerr won't do. Kerr showed up and claimed that Donald Trump's a unique threat to American democracy, the usual talking points. But when Steve Kerr was directly asked about whether he would support basic human rights around the world. In China, he took the opportunity to compare America and China and argue that they're actually very similar. Steve Kerr is a coward. Greg Popovich is a coward. Adam Silver is a coward. LeBron James is a coward. Everyone who rips America and has refused to give an opinion, Mark Cuban, on China is a coward, and they are one of the reasons why the NBA brand has collapsed with much of the American public. What Kerr did last night is a furtherance of the opposite of what his teammate Michael Jordan, who was actually super talented and made Kerr relevant, said back in the day, which remains true today. Republicans buy sneakers too. If I owned an NBA team, 
I would want Republicans, Democrats, and independents all for one to be fans of my team. The fact that that's not occurring is because of people like Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, Adam Silver, Mark Cuban, and LeBron James, because they have embraced far left-wing politics. They ridicule America and make excuses for China. Let me be clear. If the NBA had simply adopted the proposition of every country doesn't have the same rules or laws that we do, But we believe that it's important to bring basketball to every country in the world because we think there's harmony in bringing the game of basketball to everyone. I wouldn't have any issues with it at all. Because your goal would be to expand your product, your game, to the furthest reach as possible. That's actually the goal of capitalism. It's to grow your business as big as it can possibly get. That's not what the NBA's done. The reason why I don't criticize the PGA golfers who decided to sign up for Live, or the WWE when they go to Saudi Arabia, is because as leagues, players, and organizations, they've never ripped American foundational values and made excuses for China. They simply say, hey, WWE, we want to go everywhere. UFC, we want to go everywhere. If you make that decision, golf, we want to play everywhere around the world. If you make that decision, then I think that's fine. You're following the Michael Jordan example. That's what I would do if I were an athlete. I really believe. I would say, look, I want my product to be as widely distributed as possible. I want everybody to buy my tennis shoes. I want everybody to watch my fights, watch my games, consume my product. It's not what the NBA's done. They're hypocrites, and they deserve to be called out for the hypocrisy. I mentioned Democrats, Republicans, Independents. As I am speaking to you right now, there is gambling odds, there are gambling odds, that would suggest that RFK Jr. is on the verge of dropping out of the um, uh, presidential race and endorsing Donald Trump. Uh, In particular, let me give you the absolute latest on those as I am speaking to all of you. Uh, Right now, by the way, Trump and Kamala, after day one of the DNC, dead even. In fact, Trump has actually taken back the lead. I will tweet this out after this show is over. Trump has taken back the lead with $666 million, ironically enough, for those of you with a Christian background. With $666 million bet, Trump has now taken back the lead in who will be elected president of the United States. Very tiny lead, 49.3% to 49% uh, as I am speaking to all of you. And will, uh, let's see if it's still up or not, will RFK Jr. drop out was one of the top uh, top betted markets on Polymarket. And I do not see this now. It looks like I'm going to have to scroll down for a while It had hit over 70%, up to 80%. Uh, Adam, have they pulled that? Will you go on Polymarket and look up what the absolute latest on that is? Uh, Sometimes they pull the markets when it becomes highly likely. Nicole Shanahan went on a show. She is the vice presidential nominee uh, for RFK Jr. and said they had to make a decision about whether to drop out and endorse Trump or stay in. Um, So... Uh, that is uh, worth considering what exactly is going to happen there. But again, Trump has taken the lead in the gambling markets. Kamala's odds began to collapse when she gave her speech on uh, economics. 80%, Adam says, for some reason I'm not seeing it on my screen, 80% chance that RFK Jr. is going to drop out and that he would theoretically potentially endorse Trump. Um, Okay, one idea. That I have. I was at the RNC. I watched the DNC last night. One idea that I have. Teleprompters should be banned from all convention speeches. That is, they should not be allowed. You should be able to walk in with a yellow legal pad. These are the last two days of radio show and outkick the show notes that I have. Um, You should be able to walk in with a yellow legal pad or with notes put them down in front of you, and use them as a part of your speech, you should not have access to a teleprompter. All you do when you read a teleprompter is read off glass, 
it is why everything is so profoundly inauthentic at all of these speeches uh, at the Republican convention, Democrat convention, whatever it is. I would submit to you that politics would be 100% more authentic, 100 times more authentic even, and 90% of current politicians would be out the window if you had to actually just stand and without a teleprompter make arguments for what you believe in. I think a teleprompter has made politics super inauthentic and even hard to watch. Last night I was reading... I had television on mute. I watched AOC. I watched Hillary Clinton. I watched Ashley Biden. I watched Jill Biden. I watched Joe Biden. I watched five speeches. I don't know if I'll watch any tonight because I got to go pick up my kids. And uh, uh, tomorrow I've got uh, football. My, uh, my eighth grader has a football game tomorrow. So I may be out running around for the next couple of days, not able to sit and watch speeches. I watched last night. Teleprompter should be banned. I think it would make politics better. Uh, a couple of other uh, comments that are out there. Andy Bashir is the Kentucky governor. I think Andy Bashir is one of the biggest frauds in all of America. I think he's a loser. I think Kentucky failed on an epic level in reelecting him last year. Kentucky, by the way, is the only SEC state that has a Democrat governor. Think about that for a minute. Arkansas, Oklahoma, yes, now an SEC state. Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, Tennessee, Missouri. I'm sorry if I forgot anybody in there. Every SEC state, with the exception of Kentucky, has a Republican governor. Kentucky failed in putting Andy Bashir in the first time because his daddy was governor, and then re-electing him again is an embarrassment. But Andy Bashir this morning went on going after J.D. Vance. He has now prostrated himself in front of the left wing of his party, arguing that J.D. Vance should be ridiculed because Andy Bashir doesn't like him for some reason. He was talking about abortion policy, and he said that J.D. Vance's position on rape as it pertains to abortion was unacceptable, and he said he thinks... He hopes that someone will make him go through this. Now, because J.D. Vance is actually a Republican, he's willing, J.D., I would imagine, to admit that he can't get pregnant. So I don't think that Andy Bashir can say that he was talking about he hopes J.D. Vance gets raped and pregnant. That's awful, but because he's a Republican, J.D. Vance would acknowledge he can't get pregnant. So the only way that J.D. Vance could go through this, again, the quote is, make him go through this. The only way that he could be made to go through this is if his wife is raped and impregnated by her rapist or if one of his little kids, I believe he has at least one girl, if his daughter is raped and impregnated. This is pretty awful. Now, people misspeak. Maybe Andy Bashir could come back and clear this up. When he said, make him go through this, maybe he could explain how that could be possible without a member of J.D. Vance's family getting raped. Andy Bashir refused to clarify the comment and said he stood by it when he was interviewed later in the day on MSNBC. What a dickhead. I mean, just straight up. What an indefensible jerk Andy Bashir is. I don't agree. Uh, with J.D. Vance on that perspective. I believe in uh, exceptions for rape, incest, life of a mother. I also believe that the line on abortion should be drawn somewhere in the first trimester. We can argue about exactly where that is. Every state has the ability to make their decision, okay? Some of you disagree with me. That's your right. It's a great thing about the democratic process. But can you imagine going on television and saying, that you hoped anybody's wife or kids got raped so you could make him go through this? And then when you're given the opportunity to go on MSNBC and clear up what you said, you double down on it and say that you don't have any need to clarify it at all? Again, the quote is pretty simple. Make him go through this. Talking about rape, abortion, 
and what should happen there. This is one of the most disgusting things that I've heard any politician say. Can you imagine if a Republican said that about a Democrat, they would be losing their minds? Again, Andy Bashir, I'm not saying everybody's perfect. Sometimes you misspeak. I'm on, the, I'm on the air live for basically four hours every day. Three hours of radio, half hour plus of this, multiple television interviews, lots of radio interviews with affiliates. I am doing, speaking, four hours every day. Every sentence that I say is not going to be perfect. Every fact that I try to get right is not going to be perfect. It's why they said, hey, what do you want on your show? I got Adam now. I got a fact checker in real time. If I'm talking about an issue, I can say, hey, can you look this up? Make sure I get it right. Try to do that on Clay and Buck too. Not going to be perfect, but that's the goal. You're not always going to speak perfectly. Andy Bashir had an opportunity to go on and explain what he meant by make him go through this and he didn't and wasn't willing to clarify that it seems quite certain that the only way this could happen is either J.D. Vance's wife gets raped or you end up with one of his kids getting raped and then getting pregnant and having to have the baby. I mean, this is, this is pretty indefensible stuff. Uh, a couple of other stories that are out there. Um, Sam Ponder was fired. This happened last week, uh, I think on Friday. Uh, and I was not on the air, so I didn't react to it. I like Sam Ponder. I think it's not coincidental that Sam Ponder is the only woman at ESPN who has come out and said sports should only be played, but women's sports should only be played by women, and then she gets fired. I don't think that's coincidental. I know RG3 also got fired. Uh, I think those two things are not connected, and my suspicion would be they fired RG3 to try not to draw attention to the fact that they were firing Sam Ponder. That's my suspicion. But they now have replaced Sam Ponder with Mike Greenberg, which makes no sense to me. Um, so anyway, Mike Greenberg is now the new NFL host. They said that they fired Sam Ponder, ESPN did, for budgetary reasons. This is BS. And honestly, there should be better sports media coverage than there is because there's so many people out there that will just carry water on these stories. Someone should actually say, wait a minute. Three weeks basically before the season starts, one week before the college football season starts, you decide that you've got to fire people to save money on your multi-billion, billion-dollar budget with what these guys make, which might be a few million dollars a year, which, by the way, you're still going to be obligated to pay them out on when you have a contract and you fire someone. And it's not for cause. You have an obligation to pay them out. Um, so you're not even saving money. You're still paying them millions of dollars. You're just not using them. Uh, I think this is a punishment for Sam Ponder and designed to be a weapon that they can show, hey, if you say the wrong thing and we think you're expendable, we will fire you. To me, that's the clear message being sent here. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about this. I believe also on Friday... A court ruling came down in favor of FUBU, which is a basically like YouTube TV-esque brand that is trying to allow you to buy all of the cable channels as a streaming offering. They sued ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers that had created a offering that was going to be called Venue, V-E-N-U, -E that would offer all three of those uh, properties and the sports that are on them. So you would get, for instance, with Fox, the NFL, you would get uh, World Series, NASCAR, whatever sports that are offered by Fox, Big Ten, you would also get ESPN, so you'd get the SEC, you'd get Monday Night Football, uh, you would get the tennis, all these other things that uh, ESPN offers, NHL, college basketball, all of that. You'd get Warner Brothers in the short term, the NCAA tournament, and one year of the NBA. And then you would get uh, the, the NASCAR, whatever other things Warner Brothers offers. Fascinating opinion which I read from the judge saying that she believed it was likely an antitrust violation for ESPN, Fox, and WBD, Warner Brothers, to be offering this product and not allowing FUBU to do it as well. Because FUBU had wanted, as had other outlets, including DirecTV, the opportunity to offer a sports tier. 
that cost less and might be just for sports fans. Hey, here's FS1, here's ESPN, here's TNT, TBS, but without having to take all the ancillary channels associated with those brands. It's interesting because I think that Disney may have walked into a buzzsaw here because if this is considered to be an antitrust violation, why would ESPN going direct to consumer not be an antitrust violation as well? I haven't heard anybody else talk about this, but this actually calls into question the legitimacy of ESPN going direct to consumer and not allowing a smaller, skinnier bundle to be offered by the FUBUs, the DirecTVs, the Comcasts of the world that are out there in the cable and satellite picture. Very fascinating. And again, the logic of this decision would suggest that ESPN standalone, I'm not talking about ESPN Plus, which is different. I'm talking about the traditional ESPN channel itself may not be permitted to be offered if the logic of this judge's opinion stands. Now, ESPN, Fox, and WBD have all appealed, and we'll see what the next judge says. But FUBU with a huge win that could call into question the entirety of the game plan associated with going direct to consumer with the ESPNs of the world. A couple of other stories that are out there. Uh, Alvin Bragg, I'm surprised this hasn't gotten more attention. I think it's because it's in the DNC, it's a legal issue, and a lot of people don't understand it. Alvin Bragg has announced he is the Manhattan District Attorney who got the conviction over the bookkeeping uh, felonies that were elevated from a misdemeanor to a felony in New York City. Alvin Bragg has said he will not oppose a delay in sentencing on the Trump conviction there. It's a big deal because now Judge Merchan is standing alone in making a decision. Trump has asked for a delay based on the Supreme Court immunity ruling. Alvin Bragg's office now says we won't oppose that. So the judge himself has to decide whether to levy a punishment on September 18th against Trump or do what he should do which has pushed the sentencing back beyond the actual election and also allow a, an appeal from Trump to be uh, further run through the courts to see whether or not the conviction that was given on Trump is impacted by the presidential immunity ruling from the Supreme Court. Now, legally, that may be a bit complicated for some of you, but the easy way and solution that a rational, reasonable judge who was not motivated by extreme partisanship, now that Alvin Bragg has not opposed this, what should happen is they should go ahead and push this back and allow the appeal to play out. Trump couldn't be sentenced if he wins the election, but this would essentially end the lawfare components against Trump because the Chutkin case has been tossed to the curb. I don't think the Fannie Willis Georgia case is ever going to trial and the South Florida case has been dismissed, this would mean that all of that is an unmitigated disaster that has blown up in the Democrat Party's face. And indeed, you barely hear Kamala Harris talking about any of this at all. Biden's the only one that really spends much time on this. Uh, okay, a couple of other stories. These are both fun. Uh, well, three more stories. Oklahoma State has put QR codes on the back of their helmet to allow people to make NIL donations. This is crazy. I, I, the analogy that I've made for college football is basically the Berlin Wall came down. We went from, hey, if you sell your cleats that you wore in a game, if you sell your own jersey, if you sign an autograph and make money off of it, you're ineligible to play college football, to there are now QR codes on the helmets and people during games can get your QR code and donate money to the Oklahoma State NIL fund. This is crazy. You want to talk about the Berlin Wall coming down. This is like when suddenly communism ended in Eastern Europe and you could sell your kidney, you could sell nuclear weapons, you could just buy up like a, uh, a, a steel factory. They went from complete restriction of all markets to unregulated 
in all facets communism to capitalism overnight. That's basically what's happened in college football. I think it's really funny. Congratulations. I've never met her. I haven't been on the show. I doubt that I will be on the show, although I'd probably go on. Alexandra Cooper, who was one half of the Call Her Daddy uh, podcast team, has just signed a huge monster deal with Sirius XM. She is leaving Spotify, and she is going to be paid over $100 million for the next three years. Woo! That is a monster deal. Congratulations to her, Alexandra Cooper, three years, over $100 million. I've never listened to this show. I hear that it is hugely popular with girls, I don't know what, like 18 to 34-ish college-age girls, 20-somethings, early 30s. I think that's roughly the window, like probably 90% female. Uh, Three-year, $100 million plus from Sirius XM. Congratulations. I'm in favor of anybody in audio making as much money as possible. Uh, because all my deals in next year, and uh, I want to make as much money as possible for the rest of my career, too. I'm a capitalist. Rising tide lifts all boats. Congratulations, Alexander Cooper. Uh, finally, I saw this, and I thought it was really fun. Um, Liz Willis, I think, is who I saw shared it. Uh, these are the most, uh, this is the most annoying male hobbies. The most annoying male hobbies out there, uh, according to a list that I saw circulating. I thought this was very, very funny. Um, here is that, uh, that list. Let me make sure that I get it pulled up directly in front of me. What, uh, what are the least attractive hobbies for men, according to women? Number one, this may or may not su- uh, surprise a lot of you, playing video games. This doesn't really surprise me. Lots of women play men, find men playing video games unattractive, particularly the older you get. If you're in your 40s like me and you are playing video games, I can see why women do not find it attractive. Certainly in your 30s, basically if you're a dad and you're playing video games, I don't think there's very many times where women are like, oh my God, I can't wait to rip his clothes off. This is so sexy. Collecting figurines, second uh, most anno- least attractive hobby for men. Magic tricks. I love this. Some poor guy out there. He's got a deck of cards. He's trying to work on his magic game. Women find it to be the third least attractive hobby. Online trolling. I mean, is that really a hobby? Like, yeah, it's kind of, I mean... It's weird, I guess, if that's just like, hey, you know what my favorite thing to do is online troll. I worked all day. Now I'm going to get on my phone and just say mean things to people. I think that's a weird, but whatever. I feel like if I didn't have my job, I don't think I would be much on social media. I really don't. Um, I'm not on Facebook. You know, everybody's like, oh, I'm going to hang out and see what my high school friends are doing and saying. Like, I, I haven't been on Facebook in like a decade. Um I'm not really on uh, Instagram that much. Like, I post photos occasionally. They clip these segments, and they post them, and they're shared on Instagram. It's not like I'm sitting around, like, all day on Instagram. I'm not on TikTok at all. Like, the show, the OutKick is. I really think, I've got buddies who practice law full-time. They're not on social media. It's like, I don't have the time, and I get it. I don't think I would be on if I were working full-time doing other things. I think I'd want to do other things that are more fun. Gambling, I obviously do that. Sports gambling picks go up tomorrow for the first time with the Florida State-Georgia Tech game. Uh, I felt bad for this guy. Building model trains. I mean, the poor bastard's just sitting there in his conductor hat, choo-choos, you know, like doing whatever he have to do to build an amazing model train collection and nobody wants to fuck him. I feel bad for model train guy. A bunch of you guys shared from the Sopranos. Uh, Bobby, I think it was, was a model train guy. Uh, I feel bad for Bobby. I feel bad for model train guy. You're just trying to build your nice little model trains and nobody will bang you. Uh, that feels to me like a really unfair thing. Taxidermy. I think that's kind of weird. 
I'm be honest with you. Like, you take dead animals and you stuff them, and the weirder ones are, like, you stuff them into doing things that, like, humans would do. That feels a little serial killer to me, all right? I'm not talking about, like, the taxidermist who takes the grizzly bear and, like, has a grizzly bear on the wall. I think that's kind of cool. I'm talking about, like, hey, these are chipmunks, and I'm going to make it look like they're playing music. Like, that feels a little serial killer to me. I can see why women wouldn't want to sleep with guys who do that. Uh, Comic book collecting. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. And then poor bastards bird watching. I, you know, bird watch. These are the least attractive, basically the least sexy male hobbies. You know what's funny about this? Every man doesn't care what a woman's hobbies are if she's hot enough. So women have all these complaints. Oh, he's playing video games. Oh, he's doing model trains. Oh, he's collecting figurines or he's got comic books or whatever else. They have all these complaints. I don't think any man would complain about anything a woman did if she, as her hobby if she was hot enough. Now, like if your hobby is just I'm going to spend as much money as possible, which, to be fair, that does seem to be some women's hobbies. Um, I can kind of see that. That's more of an economic conflict than a hobby conflict. I used to have this conversation. Uh, some of you will remember it from Clay and uh, from, from Outkick, the coverage from my Outkick morning sport talk show. I think snakes is my thing. I don't think I could. I've been married for 20 years. I don't think I could date a chick, no matter how hot she was, if she kept multiple snakes as pets. I think I would walk in like the grandfather on The Simpsons. I would walk in, oh, you keep like cobras or you keep like three or four different snakes and you feed them mice and like something's going on there. I'm turning around and walking right back out. Snakes is probably the only hobby I can think of that's legal for a super hot chick to be into where I would be like, yeah, I don't think I can date you. I wouldn't feel comfortable sleeping there. The snakes always get out. What's going on there that she likes to feed live mice to snakes and watch them? There's something deep, dark that I don't want to penetrate or touch going on in that soul. I'm out. It's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head that is so unbelievably spooky to me that I would be like, I'm out. No matter how hot the chick is, you got a, you got a snake, I'm out. Uh, all right, I love all of you. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP, I'm Clay Travis. I'll be back tomorrow with much more frivolity, fun, and brilliance on Outkick the Show.